parasitoids, uh, and this is part of the, of the overall integrated management of filth flies. Um, let's see if I can figure out this. One of the new things, uh, relatively new, uh, that have uh, ways of housing animals, calves uh, in the area, is the use of coveralls. In this greenhouse coverall in the background here. Uh, this is kind of a step up or a different approach to what has been kind of a common way of looking at the uh, housing with the calf hutches. Uh, it has uh, a lot of advantages. You've got a lot of animals in there uh, at plenty more time. You can group them at different age groups. It's a lot better for uh, ventilation, a lot better for management uh, of moisture, of uh, different bedding things, and better control overall on the, uh, the fly system. That's our click. Oh. So you can just stand there. And <laughs> 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 Although this is supposed to work, we'll do that later. We'll yeah, do that later. We're fine for the point. I can't get the advantage. Okay, so, so just so we'll let you out. know. We'll be out of state. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the caps here. Uh, if I were to give five minutes to a fly management problem on a dairy farm, I would check out the cap areas. One of the areas uh, that is. Lots of, uh, lots of animals. Uh, the bedding is uh, such that it can get wet from urine, from spilled water and such. Perfect conditions, moist organic matter is perfect for us uh, stable flies. The animals are small, they can't crush the developing larvae or pupae of the flies. So you have a tendency of fly populations to build up uh, more quickly in these types of conditions than we do in some of the larger animals. Uh, this is what a typical inside of a, of a coverall looks like. A uh, nice lane there uh, for moving uh, feet and such. You can see the animals in your side in, in their individual cages. Uh, this particular one, they're using cedar shavings. Really good for fly management. And uh, a very clean operation. The two flies that we're talking about are house flies and for stable flies. Uh, house flies, as you can see here, nuisance problems. Uh, and in a situation where we have uh, collected them, this is a, one of those giant fly tapes, uh, fly papers. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So this here is uh, is a giant fly paper. You can see a little bit of a fly uh, collection here. Thousands of them can be uh, found in particular uh, farms. Next slide, please. The, uh, uh, Primary test, something common to not only the dairy industry, but also uh, other uh, livestock which might have in a confined situation. Disease transmission being uh, a key thing here. E. coli, uh, staph infections uh, being uh, two of the things that these uh, can vector. Very high levels of pesticide resistance. Uh, this is something that uh, the lab has done a lot of work with I could talk about. Uh, and another time. And rapid development rates. You can go from zero to 60 kind of stuff in about 3.2 seconds. These, in, these uh, produce about two to 400 uh, eggs per animal, or I'm sorry, yeah, animal human fly. And over time, if all of those were producing flies, you have an exceptionally high developmental rate of population explosion potential. Uh, stable fly is the second one. Stable fly, by contrast, uh, this little part right here is the biting part of the fly. These are blood feeding. They are painful bites when you get them, and you probably experience them if you've been walking on the beach and got a bit around your ankle. This is a stable fly. They, uh, they can breed in the same types of conditions that a house fly would, moist organic matter. Uh, they, on the farm, you can find a lot of those, still silage, soil bedding, uh, these types of things that are common in a bedding, or calf and uh, other animal age groups in barns. Uh, and also uh, farm sites. They come in on weather fronts. They can be found uh, in the uh, ground fields, out in the field. Uh, they can be around uh, in the loping areas. They can come in from uh, infestations that have developed on seaweed and, and uh, compost piles, etc. So they're pretty ubiquitous and they move around quite a bit. Uh, these cause stress on the animals, so you have reduced growth and reduced milk 
production. And for a calf, it's going to be something that those stresses are going to affect more than the life on. So we have a number of different management alternatives that we can employ on these. And that most of it is going to rely upon cultural practices. Sanitation, cleaning up the moist organic matter, keeping things dry, is going to do a lot to minimize the potential for the habitat that these flies would succeed in. Other things, certainly, the use of insecticides or baits for sticking traps on the stock. I'm going to talk today about biological control. Our objective of the study is to look at effectiveness of two fly parasitoids. And the most common one that you can get if you were to purchase these things through an insectary is going to be a little floss. Uh, you sit it here, it's wrapped. And this is a fly tube. If you've seen them, they're really tiny. They look like little pills. And the moss attacks the tube, uh, drills a hole here, and then lays her egg. And that egg hatches. And then uh, that egg will hatch into the little wasp uh, larvae, which then basically eats the house fly. So you have minimal um, population over time. What you see, uh, <coughs> thanks. The Cedarpurex raptor is the most common one. We have a lot of data on where it goes and how well it works. Uh, it is a solitary wasp, so it lays one egg per pupae. And this will be in contrast to the next one that we'll talk about. It's aggressive and looking, it's like a little smart bomb. It, look, it searches out for these housefly pupae, lays its eggs in it, and then uh, we get good control. Uh, widespread dispersal, it is pretty active. You put it into a situation and it will move out from there. If you spread it around, they can cover a lot of ground themselves. We'll compare that to this new one that is being uh, uh, studied, it's Raptorellus. The, it is not an endemic one. It's one that's brought in, but it does very really well. It's gregarious. So what I mean there is it lays not just one egg, it lays four to eight eggs per pupae. And each of those can then feed upon the house fly uh, in development and then come out as individual wasps. So you get four and then four and four and four. So you can see the population can build up quickly over time less costly to rear, which will be important certainly if you're going to be purchasing these things, uh, you're going to get a lot of extra bang for your buck. Searching ability, it doesn't have a tendency to move out quite as much, so maybe that's one of its downsides, but uh, there's a lot of other good things. So I'll talk about two experiments that we did. First experiment was basically to look at what is the, the, uh, the kind of the gold standard, if you would, for parasitoids, this raptor versus Raptorellus, and the idea is, does uh, the control that we would get with Raptor uh, look pretty good up against Raptorellus? Do they do better or worse or the same or whatever? The next one is Raptorellus versus a mixture. How do they get along if you put them both together? And what does that mean for fly control and also economics? So we have uh, parasitoids are purchased from our local insectary. The insectary we use here in New York is IPM Laboratories. Uh, it's out of Lock, New York, it's Carol Lannister's operation. You use 500 pairs of toys per calf. You have a tendency here to move up or down depending upon conditions. If you've got uh, really good pristine conditions, you can go a little bit lower. If you've got some areas that are wet spots and potentially fly breeding areas, you can increase that. But we'll use 500 here. Uh, and we adjust that in the pods already to the calf numbers that we have. Those numbers in the greenhouse are going to, as the animals mature or get older, they will be moved out and other ones will come in. So we, we kept active on that one. We had three farms of each type. We had three farms with no releases of the, of the parasitoid, three with the raptor, and three with the raptorellus. Sam and for sampling, how do we know if it's working? We have uh, pre-data before we released it, two weeks before, uh, then for an eight-week period, during the release period, and then afterwards. Uh, what you see Colleen here doing is you get your shipments of these parasitoids that come in with uh, a number of, paras of parasitized pupae in shavings. And Colleen is distributing them in a typical situation where we would expect to see fly breed. So it's going to be over by the feed areas, back in the corners, and basically try and distribute these, these insects around as much as we can. 
Uh, weekly check-in for fly breeding, and the way we look for this is a two-pronged approach. One is we have an objective way of looking at where we use three to by five index cards. We spread them around the barn, have about 10 of them, and look for fly specking. I'll show you one of these in a moment, uh, which would be regurgitation and fecal spots. The more spots, the more it flies. Uh, the next one is for stable flies, we look for animal lake count. So we'll look at the actual animals that are standing and look for the number of flies that are around them to see how many we can see. Uh, this is looking here for signs of fly breeding, uh, looking for maggots. Uh, this right underneath the water is a really good place because it's nice and moist and splashed. Uh, the other places that would be uh, that I'd look for would be where the animals can't really get to, where they could uh, uh, not stop on things, so in corners and in the back uh, by where the uh, wall of the cover all is. This is our fly uh, checking. Uh, the uh, spot cards uh, out of reach of the animals. We check those on a weekly basis and, and replace them every week. Every so parasitoid sampling is the other way. How do you know how much parasitism you have? What we do is we take uh, 30 housefly cubi that we have raised in our laboratory, put them in this uh, mesh bag, put this is in a nice box that is crush proof so the animals can't get it. And uh, we bury those so that the end so that the flies can find them. Okay, next. Uh, so this comes from our house fly colony. Next. Ten sets of these are placed throughout the barn. Next. And we return these sentinel bags to the laboratory and hold them for a period of time to see basically how many uh, parasites emerge from the house fly pupae that are in there and how many of those pupae are dead. All right, if, they, if no flies come out, we know that they are there. Okay. So let's look at some data here. Successful parasitism uh, would be if we had emergence of the, of the wasps out of those pupae when we brought them back to the lab. Next, please. Parasitoid induced, induced mortality. Basically, we don't have a healthy fly coming out of those pupae. And total parasitism, basically what we're looking for is dead flies. Uh, what we found is, uh, looking at the farms, the predominant species that we're finding is, is going to be this raptor. On those farms where we release raptorellus, that's going to be the predominant one. But on those that we release raptor, this is what we're getting. We're also finding that there is a little bit of other species in there, that they're not quite as effective as, as raptor, and as we'll see as raptorellus. Uh, so here's the comparison of raptor and raptorellus. This is no releases. You can see the percent uh, parasitism. We didn't have a lot, as you can see there, lots of healthy flies come out of this. This is our gold standard as raptor. Uh, we did get pretty good percent uh, parasitism there, but even better on this raptorellus. If you remember, raptorellus is the one that has four or so wasps per pupae. This is total parasitism, so this would be dead flies when we brought them back to the uh, to the lab. Again, no, uh, this is no release. You can see that both raptor and raptorellus do a pretty good job. Raptorellus is uh, uh, doing a little bit better job in this particular case. Next. Well, what I'd like you to see here is in these release things. This is raptor, raptorellus, successful parasitism. Does a very nice job. Uh, Parasitite induced mortality, this would be uh, uh, emerging flies, basically we do uh, about the same amount here. If we add them up, we're getting good fly control. The higher the number, the better the fly control. Next slide. What we did then was we found Raptorellus does a good job. What does Raptor do? Um, uh, Raptor does a very good job as well. How do they react when we put them both together? And we used a 50-50 mixture here. This is no releases. What we found here is that they do get along pretty well. And they do a very good job of fly control. Next slide. Uh, we can see that here. This is the releases. Uh, they did about the same when they're put together. Uh, the parasitoid and the mortality is about the same. And they did a very good job of fly control. OK, next slide. Conclusions. Parasitoids are the ones we release them. They're the ones that are predominant species. That's a good thing. Hope for. 
comparatism level for low on no release farms, we can see that the raptor is the most prevalent species. That's an endemic one. It's going to be uh, common to all of our northeast area farms. And there's effective fly parasitism with both of those species. Okay. And we think that this raptor ellis is got a good fit for our dairy farms. Okay. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention is the cost of these things. And we looked at the 50-50 mixture versus raptor ellis alone. And we see the raptor ellis alone results in about 60 to 85, 80 percent mortality of the sentinel pupae. So it does a very, very nice job. Nearly twice that of just raptor alone. Okay? An equivalent, uh, it's going to be a lower cost. And this is really uh, the, the take home here is that they do a good job. The raptor costs, if you have 100 calves or 500 pairs of foot per calf for 12 weeks to fly uh, season, basically, it's going to be around 1100 bucks. If you have a mixture of these raptor and raptor ellis, uh, and in different ratios here, you can see this is going to have a reduced price. So good fly control, reduced price. And the, the real uh, advantage here, certainly, if the cost is an issue for a farmer, which it which always is, we can see that a cheaper price is going to be uh, a lot more attractive to people and the potential for enhanced idea of adoption. And I think I'll end right there. Uh, this I just mentioned earlier comes from work from Bill Coffin, who's now down at the University of Florida. Uh, Don Rutz is on phase retirement from the New York State ITM funding. There is a paper that's kind of it's in review right now that talks more about the stuff that's going to talk about here. Thanks. We have to really limit the questions. We can take maybe two questions right now. We don't want to get behind. Is raptor ellis such that it has to be introduced each year, or does it? Both are successful. Yeah, both of those, uh, uh, it would have to be reduced, uh, in, introduced. And, and actually, what we're talking about here is really inundative releases. And the reason is the flies have, in, under the right conditions, and those conditions being warm, wet, moisture, that type of stuff, they can in, go from an egg to an adult in as few as seven days, seven to ten days. So the parasitoids take two to three weeks to develop. So what you're trying to do is, is keep up with the fly population. That's why weekly releases is what's called. Thank you. Um, and using these parasitoids, um, you, I'm assuming you can't release any other kind of insecticide in the barn, or you can't put anything on the animal because it'll affect the wasps? Uh, that would be, that would be the, the recommendation. Uh, there are situations where things have gotten out of control, and, and you do have to use uh, something and a pyrethrin is probably going to be a better thing to use because it's not going to have the residual that's going to be there over time. But I might build on that just yeah. this one comment is I wouldn't recommend the use of these parasitoids uh, as the first line of defense. What I would suggest is that really 90% or so of fly management is going to be in cultural control. So if we're doing an exceptional job or as good as we can do uh, in, the, in the barn that we're working in on sanitation, that's going to really set the stage for these guys to do the best job they can do. If we have you know, more time at the end, you know, we'll definitely 